Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session. I'm Ian Frinaskiewicz, Director, Open Research Solutions at PLOS. I co-organize this session with Jadranka Sternowski, uh, and she will be appearing later uh, to help manage the question and answer segment of the session. Now, very briefly, uh, an introduction, but we do have a lot of uh, interesting information to share with you today. Uh, the Some of the context for this session, the, the culture and practice of assessing research and researchers based upon publications in journals with high impact factors is a barrier to wider adoption of open science and a barrier we keep returning to uh, in discussions about open access, about open science and, and about open research. Despite the potential of open research practices for improving research quality, efficiency, and impact, open science practices are largely absent from policies and criteria for academic hiring, promotion, and grant review. And this, this fact was recently highlighted by a research paper um, that inspired the title for, for this session. Now, this uh, absence um, of open science practices from some of the, the, the criteria that are used to evaluate research does limit some of the incentives for researchers to practice open research. But there are some initiatives in the community uh, and internationally that are beginning to identify, share and communicate examples of research assessment procedures that are in fact placing greater value on open science and open research. So to that end, our panel, will outline the challenges of recognizing open research practices and research assessment. They'll look at some supporting evidence, sometimes from their own research, and will discuss recent progress on reforming research assessment. So uh, we have a formidable panel to discuss this important topic. Now, I won't read out their CVs in full, for purposes of time, you might notice we have five, uh, five different speakers today, but you are free to do so in your own time. Um, feel free to look them up or there is a, a list of speaker bios that, that we can put in the chat. So in order of their presentations today, we are going to kick off with Juan Pablo Alperin, uh, who is co-director of the Scholarly Communications Lab at Simon Fraser University in Canada. We'll then follow with Izuchuku Azuka Okafor, who's a reproductive biology research scholar at Pan African University Life and Earth Sciences Institute and University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Following up with a last minute change to our program, we will have Dominique Babini, uh, Open Science Advisor at the Latin American Forum for Scientific Evaluation, FOLEC, which is an initiative of the Latin American Council of Social Sciences. Uh, standing in for Laura Ravelli, who is also at Claxo Folex. So thank you very much, Dominique, uh, for, for joining us today and Laura for your contributions. Um, following, uh, following Dominique will be Vinciane Gaillard, uh, Deputy Director for Research and Innovation at the European University Association in Belgium. And finally, Jean-Emmanuel Faure, uh, Team Leader for Research Assessment European Commission in Belgium. So very briefly, some housekeeping before we kick off with our first presentation. Our first speaker, uh, Juan Pablo, will define the landscape and problems in research assessment and open science, in part informed by their research into scholarly communication and research culture with a slightly longer presentation. What we will then do is have a number of shorter presentations or statements of up to about eight minutes each to give perspectives of different stakeholders across different regions globally. Uh, so we'll hear from more about the researcher perspective, we'll hear from regional and international research assessment initiatives, we'll hear from universities, and we'll also hear from funder and policymaker and their perspective to give us hopefully a very broad, uh, broad understanding of, um, of the environment. So we encourage participants to act, to interact throughout the meeting uh, in, in the chat because the presentations will go on for around about 45 minutes or so. Um, but of course, do add your questions for the panel discussion at the end using the Q&A function. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first speaker. Juan Pablo, if you're there, please continue. Great, thank you. 
give me one second to get my screen share and my screens organized and I will be ready to begin. Okay, we can confirm that you can see everything and kind of just sort of- uh, um, Yes, you know. we can see. Great. Okay, so great. So thank you uh, for the invitation to take part in this uh, in this panel, and, and thank you for being here. Let me begin first by uh, acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional te um, territories of the uh, Coast Salish people um, in in Canada. They're unceded territories, and I am um, here and grateful for the stewardship of this land that I am a part of, and uh, for all of since time uh, immemorial. Uh, it's very important for us uh, in Canada trying to um, participate in a process of decolonization to make sure that we acknowledge that these territories are really um, theirs and that we are here as uninvited guests. Um, let me um, also just say, but thank you again for the invitation to, to take part and to say hi to some uh, friends that I've already seen in the participant uh, list. Um, I was just with Jadranka in Croatia, just got back yesterday and now I'm back um, uh, in Vancouver. It's also nice to share the screen again with, uh, with Dominique, who's a, also a longtime friend. So, uh, and to all of those of you in the chat as well, thank you for being here. Um, you'll notice that I've kind of turned around the title of the panel uh, for the title of my own presentation as I try to frame this uh, as I try to frame uh, this conversation and trying to try to use my bit to sort of uh, give us a little bit of an orienting frame for the rest of the presentation that will follow and hopefully the discussion that will follow as well. Because um, I think that then the reason I've turned that around is because there is sort of this uh, question as to sort of what came first. Is it that open we want open science to change the incentives? Or are we trying to get the incentives uh, to change what people do in terms of uh, in terms of open science? Right there, there is a, a really a chicken and egg problem here. That if we don't have the right incentive, then we don't get the kind of open science practices that we want. But also, if we don't see the open science practices sort of uh, taking place, can they be influencing uh, what it is that universities are or what research uh, researchers are being asked to do? So, so you know, the question is. Which goes which goes first? Is it that the chicken is the you know the chicken is the incentives and it's given um, it's going to give us the open science eggs or is it is it the other way around? Right. Uh, I'll maybe argue that it's maybe something a little bit more like this. I think perhaps we have sort of cooked the incentives uh, in such a way and we've sort of have transformed them. Uh, they're eating uh, the uh, they're they're eating sort of like the, you know the incentives are there and they're sort of open science sort of being mashed into them. Uh, in some way into those incentives that are, are, are in place. And if we were to sort of try to continue this very bad metaphor, and this is what happens when you prepare a presentation when you're um, traveling and jet lagged and trying to do this uh, in exhaustion, you start sort of playing around with the metaphor that probably wasn't a good, very good one to start with. But I would say perhaps we can think of it as that we sort of need to have healthy incentives and proper incentives in order to have very sort of good and nutrition eggs uh, of open science. Um, but what we have perhaps done is have turned those incentives and we've, uh, we have already cooked them and it's not very hard to get any eggs at all because those incentives are, you know, they're not going to give fruit or giving us uh, something to eat in the long term. Or we can think about this metaphor as sort of saying, look, we're feeding these open science eggs to the incentives and it's making to, to the chickens, so that, you know, to, and, and it's making the chickens sick. And so it's a little bit perverse and that we're feeding sort of in this cannibalistic way that the incentives and the and the open science practices are sort of um, related in a way that we're kind of all participating and we're saying okay well we're keeping um, we're seeing open science continue to survive and be around but we all feel a little bit complicit in doing this thing where we don't quite feel right about the incentives that we have put in place to make that happen. Or we can think again, this is the last one, and then I will move on to the core of the presentation, but that we're kind of pecking away at doing open science, right? Like we're sort of saying, okay, well, the, 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 the chicken is being kept alive, it's eating away by, you know, we're, we're sort of doing these open science practices a little bit at a time and sort of um, keeping the whole system going alive. But we, the chickens are in this chicken farm and they're in, a, uh, you know, we're part of this larger corporate system where we're keeping it alive, we're, we're producing open science eggs, all of these open science products. We don't realize that we're actually producing them uh, and just feeding a system that is uh, on the whole unhealthy, even though uh, we're within the cage and feeling that we're, we're happy. Okay, so I'm, this again, I was just sort of playing around with this idea of how we think about these things. But I think that part of the framing that I want to give us today is that we can't really, that there is a really a relationship that is a little bit um, unclear and complex between the incentives that exist and the practices that we are perhaps trying to encourage and that we want to uh, that we want to see, um, and this is, and then the question is, where do these incentives 
live? How do we, if we want to incentivize open science practices, where is it that we can find uh, these, uh, uh, where is it that we can sort of affect and, and put these incentives in place? And this is, was the heart, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of some of the results from the review tenure and promotion project that, uh, that I and, and folks at, the, at my uh, at Skalcom lab took part of for the last sort of six years. Uh, we're kind of wrapped up now, but uh, when I sort of, we were sort of asking, you know, do these incentives live in the review tenure and promotion guidelines of, um, of universities? This is the place where ex ex uh, incentives in the North American, the Canadian and American context are very much fixed in these review tenure guidelines. Is this the place that we can see them? And there was an idea floating around when we started the project or before we started the project that all we needed to do was uh, sort of change the form, right? change the incentives that get written down um, into those review tenure and promotion guidelines and that that would lead to changes in, uh, in practices. And so first I'll invite you to look at, uh, if you want to sort of get an overview of the project, all of this, the, the results and research I'll put putting forward today, we have a sort of a beautiful set of infographics. There's a, the blog post that's linked at the bottom left there um, on that bit.ly link. You can go and get the very brief overview, um, but there's also, you can find all the links to the actual published papers as well as infographics that summarize these things. So if you're interested in, because I'm kind of going to blitz through some of the um, uh, some of the results, but if you're interested in looking in more detail at the results of the research, um, just make a note of that little bit, the URL at the bottom, that blog post has the links to the longer, uh, to all of the other pieces, okay? Um, you don't need to worry about grabbing each of the individual ones. Um, so what we did for that project, just very briefly, is we, we were looking at just the Canadian and US context. We managed to get a hold of their review tenure promotion guidelines of 129 universities from across um, uh, sort of from a representative set of uh, different types of institutions, research oriented ones, more that are master's levels and some that are just baccalaureate. And we looked for to what extent are open science practices and different terms and concepts related to them present in those documents. And what we found is that, you know, the idea that we don't encourage public or community engagement um, is it, not exactly as simple as that. These documents actually, when you look at uh, the percentage of the institutions that contain terms like public community and community engagement is actually fairly high. You know, we see it's over 80% uh, and almost, almost 90% include the word sort of community and the concept of public engagement is a little bit less, but still is present uh, in, in those documents. But it also turns out that at the same time, we also have the terms related to research metrics uh, also present at these documents, in particular at the research type institutions. So we do see similar levels of institutions that are concerned with the word impact, the word metrics, and the concept of traditional research outputs. Uh, in some way, we're talking here articles, uh, books, conference presentations, was present at over 90% of the institutions across the board. So we do have everything present, but there is, um, uh, there is a little bit of a sort of discrepancy between what we are uh, so those stated goals of publicness, because we found lots of sort of mentions of those things, although no clear um, ways of assessing it. And then we saw the presence of these uh, traditional research outputs, uh, impact and metrics being also a concern um, in those documents. Um, this caused us to, in another study, actually probably this is probably the one of the studies from this project that is, has been less, least read and least cited, but it's in my view, the most, one of the most interesting ones. Um, is that we looked at what are different things that are incentivized and, and present in these, uh, in these documents. And we found that there's actually a lot of different types of outputs that are mentioned in the review tenure promotion guidelines. So it's not that we don't encourage different kinds of outputs from our faculty, right? We see and we sort of categorize them. And this is, we sort of did a um, bottom-up categorization of the, every different kind of outputs. This is great work actually by Carol uh, Munoz Nieves, who is a, a master's student at the, uh, at the time. She sort of really led the classification of all of these outputs. Um, and turns out there's a lot of things that are actually already in these review tenure and promotion guidelines around different kinds of things that we want to see people do. Although, of course, not surprising, uh, they're not all present to the same degree. Uh, unspecified outputs, which sort of lead people to those traditional ones, but also explicitly traditional outputs. Um, uh, education, their process stands in for textbooks, mostly. Um, traditional events, grants, those are the things that are present in the most number of, uh, of documents. So again, we see the inclusion of different kinds of, uh, you know, things like public media, arts related things. We see different kinds of uh, outputs being asked for, but we see more of certain types, which are the traditional 
uh, publications uh, and traditional measures of scholarship. And of course, we also found that there is much support for uh, the journal impact factor, especially at the research oriented institutions. And so the picture I'm trying to paint here of the different kinds of, uh, of what we're finding in these documents is we find a, a more complex picture than just one that uh, says the incentives that are written down for scholars don't talk about publicly oriented things or don't talk about different kinds of outputs. What we find is that there are very many different kinds of outputs present at these, uh, at these institutions, but that there are some that are mentioned more than others. And then we find questions like, uh, we see things like the journal impact factor also continue to be measured, which tends to skew the view that researchers or that everyone that's using these documents then have of how they should be uh, weighing or evaluating or assessing the um, everything that they're reading in those documents. And so when we see that there is actually quite a bit of support for the journal impact factor in the places where it's mentioned, when there is a mention, it tends to be supportive, almost you know 87% of those mentions that were in there were not just mentions that were saying warnings against the impact factor. Uh, some had a no, at least some note of caution, you know, it wasn't super supportive of the impact factor. And none of them mentioned the impact factor by saying, by the way, this is a bad metric that you shouldn't use, which is what most of the open science community uh, and even folks in bibliometrics have largely come to an agreement on. Um, just gonna share a couple of sort of more uh, uh, quick, uh, just one more sort of bit of uh, a study because what we, this whole project sort of was, you can kind of see the progression of how we kept thinking about these, these processes as we were trying to understand the relationship between what scholars uh, did and um, so what was found in the documents and, and, and what scholars actually do. We decided we should survey the scholars to try to understand a little bit more how they're interpreting. We, we realized there was a complexity between what's in the documents and what people do. And we did sort of, we have published two studies that looked at some of their survey results. One of them sort of looked at how people understand and make sense of these documents. And when we looked at their opinions around where they were thinking about what they themselves should do, should I publish in an open venue or should I publish certain kinds of, uh, what should I consider when I'm looking at producing my results? There was an interesting thing that emerged, which is uh, uh, researchers that responded all from the institutions for which we had documents responded, I value, readership and I care more about how much like who is the right audience for my work but my peers they care more about prestige and metrics when they publish so they see themselves in a more favorable light that they have a willingness themselves to be more open and to try to share things in a more open way because their concerns are around getting the right kind of readership but they feel like their peers are being guided by uh, the questions of impact uh, and prestige and metrics. And then the other question that we asked, which is also in another one of the studies that we, we published about this was around this question of how people were defining the terms impact, quality, and prestige. And we find that there's a lot of complexity around these, uh, these definitions. The definitions are very vague, which leaves open to interpretation. Uh, and they're also very circular. So everything gets defined. You know, What is prestige? Oh, things that are of high quality or things that have a lot of impact. What's impact? Oh, impact is publishing in places that have a lot of high prestige. And so we get these circular definitions where researchers are kind of making sense of things and it starts to leave things open for that, uh, for that uh, interpretation. Let me just sort of, um, uh, sort of wrap up by sort of getting to a couple of, uh, of the key points that I think will hopefully frame the presentations that follow um, and the discussion that we can have um, um, around what is this relationship between, is, are the incentives helping us to open up open science or is open science helping us to change the incentives. The first is that the conclusion that we had from this project is that adding open things to the incentives is not enough to make any change. We've already seen that. And in fact, we found that those, you know, these documents have largely had, uh, they've been, it, you, you could interpret them already to be able, for people to be able to do open science practices and different kinds of open scholarship. The documents have that opening in them by mentioning public scholarship, by talking about different kinds of outputs. And so adding it to the documents and this idea that if we could just insert open science practices into those explicit incentive structures at the institutions, we would be able to make changes is not enough to really change the practices. 
because it's there and we haven't seen that people have broadly adopted uh, open, open science. The second sort of important conclusion that I think it's important for us as we're listening to the following presentations to be talking to is that assessment and incentives happen broadly in the community. We, we develop a shared set of values. We're not looking at explicitly written incentives somewhere. So what my document says I'm going to be assessed at is only one picture, of the one piece of the puzzle. The researchers are actually more looking around at how they're going to be assessed by their peers. And so when we say we want to change the incentives, it's not as simple as saying, well, we need to go to the researchers and make it so that their promotion is dependent on publishing in open science. If there isn't a broader change surrounding them, then it's not going to be enough to create that change. And so we need to think about what that, um, how do we tackle this question of changing incentives? Uh, if we can't just go to the, you know, to the job requirements, we need to go more broadly at the, at the larger community and not tackle it in that single place. Um, the third sort of thing is that, uh, and this is the chicken and egg question, right? Is that the practices uh, become that are reflected in the incentives that we see and that the incentives that are in place sort of become the practices that we wanna see. There is a circular relationship here. It is not a relationship of incentives can transform open science or open science can transform the incentives. It's in fact, both things are happening at the same time. And we need to uh, really embrace this understanding that uh, the incentives reflect the community. At the same time, the community sees itself reflected in the incentives that they, that they see. And, and think about that as a model for how we try to transform incentives. Because all too often I hear in the conversations around open scholarship that we just need to change the incentives. And, and to that, I push back by saying, well, no, you need to start putting some of the practices in place and then that will transform the incentives, which was again, going to the title of this, um, of this, uh, of this panel. And finally, uh, I think that we need to really, uh, we really can't just be thinking about open science practices uh, and open science practices of saying, okay, well, this is all really just about making sure that people are uh, finding more open places to publish or, or taking different kinds of actions. I think that we need to really be thinking about embracing, uh, embracing the, the values of open science everywhere across the university. I think when we talk about changing the incentives, it's not just about looking at research assessment, it really is about what is the mission of the university and how is it that the university needs to transform itself to be more oriented and aligned with open science values. Uh, and here, um, it's really about thinking about open science as an ideology more than as a set of practices is a core message that I want to leave you with. Because I think that as we look at, and there's some really interesting and wonderful projects that I think we end up recommending at the end of all of our presentations, like the Humetrics Initiative, uh, which is really promoting sort of values-based assessment because um, it really is about thinking about how do we change the broader culture and values that we have uh, in place uh, in the institutions so that people then start taking on open science practices because that's the way to be aligned with those, uh, with those values. Um, my sort of uh, formal presentation is there, but I want to use my one more minute remaining to uh, give a plug to a different, uh, to, a, to a, um, a webinar series that we're just launching. Uh, coordinated with some great folks in uh, Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil around a different kind of open science already exists in Latin America. Um, I'll leave you the bit.ly link at the bottom there where you can sign up to get updates. The first talk is happening on Monday. Um, and it's a place to showcase different kinds of open science practices beyond open access that are already taking place that already exist in Latin America. And that we want the conversations about open science to go beyond looking at those elements that are only within the institution. So we're gonna have a webinar series over the next number of months uh, with a great lineup of, of speakers. So I just want to use my minute to give that uh, a plug. And with that, um, I'll wrap up and hopefully that sets up our other panelists for their conversations, for their presentations and for our questions that follow. Thank you. Thanks very much, Juan Pablo. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, please uh, add questions to the Q&A throughout for any of our speakers, um, but we'll move straight on to our next presentation with Izuchuku. Uh, Okafor, if, if you're ready, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much um, for 
this wonderful uh, panel. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing time joining us uh, throughout the, the, the few days. Um, I will be speaking on, one minute please. Just to point out, I think you're showing presenter view at the moment. Can you see my slide on? We can see your slides, but also your notes in the next slide. One minute later. Sorry, I'm trying to get that's, it on. That, that's okay. If it's technically difficult, I think we're we're happy with with uh, the presenter view and the notes. If you're happy with that, um, I think slides will definitely be shared afterwards as well. So um, if that's if that's more convenient for you to do it in that way, I think we can go ahead. Okay, um, sorry about that technical glitch. As part of this panel discussion, I'll be uh, reviewing the Nigerian perspective of open science and risk assessment. Uh, this topic is actually very important because of the role Nigeria, uh, Nigeria plays in uh, uh, stimulating the institutionalization of open science in Africa. Nigeria is actually in the top five in research outputs and citations in Africa. Permit me to take you a bit uh, a bit back to the UNESCO's definition of open science. Sometimes it's good to go back to the basics. Uh, from this definition of open science, uh, we can deduce that the implementation of open science and research assessment must show the ability to open the processes of evaluation beyond the traditional scientific community. When this attribute is lacking in any setting, then open science cannot be said to have been operational at all. This means that evaluation must be transparent. It must be. It must also be uh, 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 open, and again, it must have some form of external participation as well. In simpler terms, I want to say that applying open science practices during research assessment means that research assessment criteria must be accessible. It must be detailed, and it must also have some form of elements of open science within it. I created uh, a hypothetical open science research productivity model, which is supported by the opinion of Lampard and colleagues. This concept suggests that the utilization of open science in research production and assessment improves research resources, whether human or, or capital. It also submits that this is not, uh, it is not equitable to employ open science practices during research assessment when there is a very little uptake or even none at all at the research production level. Also, uh, it will be unfair and counterproductive as well when open science practices are being used during research production but not properly acknowledged or recognized. In the very words of Lampert and, and colleagues, uh, they said, the uptake of open science practice in the research process is unlikely to flourish if researchers fear that it is not properly acknowledged and officially recognized. So to implement open science and risk assessment, it is very important to know what could be assessed, why it should be assessed, and how. I've taken a look at the EU Agreement on Informing Risk Assessment that was published recently. 
there are three key things that can be assessed, either at the research organization level, at the uh, uh, assessing research projects, or even the researchers themselves. Each of these assessments can be done for different reasons, like funding, awards, disciplinary reasons, recruitment, promotion, and so on. But each of the purposes must be unique and must also be treated as such as well irrespective of the reasons for any research assessment, it must be done in such a way that the key pillars of open science are featured in the assessment. I particularly want to emphasize that science communication should not be neglected during research assessments as it had been done in some research evaluation models. What is the Nigerian situation for open science research assessment? It would be shocking to really say that the principal research funding body for higher education in Nigeria do not have an open science evaluation system. Uh, I curated uh, preliminary data on risk assessment guidelines on the top 10 universities in Nigeria. And uh, predictably, 60% of these institutions have their assessment guidelines uh, accessible online. 40% of them have their research assessment criteria very detailed, while none of these institutions at all had open science practices highlighted in the assessment criteria. I personally believe that the first success in open research assessment is the ability of everyone to have access to your uh, uh, research assessment criteria. Now, what exactly are the challenges with the application of open science practices in research assessment in Nigeria? The challenges are really numerous, but one of the key issues is that there is currently no open science policy and action plan in Nigeria for stakeholders to implement. However, it is important to acknowledge the, the works of Lipsense, Wakrin, and UNESCO so far over the years trying to develop open science policy. And we are really expectant and looking forward to having this very soon. In our recent work, we have proposed some key strategies for the implementation of open science in in Africa generally, and these are ultimately driven by leadership and effective funding across different levels. An important question to ask is, if Nigeria is too different from the rest of the globe? Evidence from the globe shows that open science penetration and research assessment for recruitment and promotional purposes is still very low. For example, a recent study by Khan and colleagues showed that less than 1% of global institutions had no explicit mention of open science in their academic job advertisements. Rice and colleagues as well published a study in 2020 and reported the inaccessibility of recruitment and promotional guidelines of more than 30% of the institutions that they reviewed. And one of the striking reasons of this inaccessibility is the unwillingness of these institutions to share these guidelines to them. As we navigate the implementation of open science in research assessment, we must bear in mind some of these considerations. Number one, we must establish a system that rewards current merit and not past successes or privileges. This is a simple way to avoid compounding the inequalities already existing in the academic communities. Secondly, we must begin to equitably address the existing structural inequalities that hamper open science. Thirdly, we must ensure that open science implementation is adapted to suit the peculiarities of each community. And finally, we must continue to test the open science indicators using different settings for more effective implementation across board. In conclusion, I dare to say that the institutionalization of open science and research assessment must be done holistically. It may just be what is needed to save researchers from the publish or perish precipice. Thank you very much. And I hope to have a wonderful uh, discussion on this panel. Thank you very much, Izuchukwu, and, and staying perfectly to time there. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have questions, uh, everyone, just a reminder, put them in the Q&A whenever you like and keep the conversation going in the chat. We will move on to our next speaker. Uh, we have Dominique Babini, uh, who will be giving, giving her presentation next uh, on behalf of Laura Ravelli uh, from Claxo Folek. Uh, take it away when you're ready, Dominique. 
Thank you very much for this invitation to Claxo to join this very interesting panel. Let me know if you see and hear this PowerPoint from prepared by Laura Rovelli. We can see it well. Okay. Our region, uh, Latin America, where research and research communications are mainly publicly funded and scholar led, is today the region with the highest percentage of its journals in open access. With the diamond model, no charges to read, no charges to publish. Research universities are the main players to implement open access legislations and policies approved in countries of the region. Universities implement the journal portals and repositories, and recently some few preprints and research data repositories. Latin America is also interesting because um, of the co-production co of knowledge with contributions from societal actors outside the academia. Good examples are in social sciences, in health sciences, in environmental research. But these research outputs and opinions published in or communicated in local languages within the region are rarely valued in research assessment, even if they can solve local needs and problems. Our region richness in bibliodiversity and multilingualism and knowledge co-production with other societal actors does not reflect in research assessment procedures used in Latin America, where rewards goes mainly to publishing one format, journals, articles published in English in journals indexed by Scopus and Web of Science which so poorly reflect knowledge produced and published within our region in quality outputs in local languages and in other bibliodiverse formats. Making invisible those contributions in the research assessment procedures has many negative impacts. Examples, researchers orient their research agendas to issues of interest to those prestige journals valued in the research assessment, and they lose interest in local research needs. Another example is concerns for underfunding of open science infrastructures because funds will be directed to EPCs needed to publish in those mainstream journals rewarded in the research assessment procedures in countries where the, uh, uh, the prestige journals are published in countries which are signing transformative agreement to transform the industry, not the scholarly communication system. And we will have to pay APCs to, pay, uh, to publish there. Claxo's Latin American Forum on Research Assessment, which started three years ago, has developed several documents to contribute in the diagnosis of research assessment in our region and make concrete proposals concerning several issues of interest for research assessment in open science contexts. An example in the left, this document about the need to value adequate bibliodiversity and multilingualism in research assessment procedures a region where reward goes to publish in English in mainstream journals. So Oleg has also organized mobilizing activities together with specialists and research funders from Latin America to work on advances in a common and agreed agenda on responsible research assessment. It is documented in the recent declaration on a new research assessment toward a socially relevant science in the region. For its multiple actions, Follet Claxo was recognized among the 15 international mobilizers and definers of responsible research assessment 
and among the 10 best websites and resources on uh, resources on the subject, according to the report of the Global Research Council. In these three years since the creation of COLEC, some lessons have been learned working together with funders, with institutions and specialists in our region and in dialogue with international initiatives that promote changes in research assessment. Lessons about the importance of context-specific incremental changes proposals for research assessment practices, acknowledging diversity in research cultures in each country. Working together with stakeholders on the design and the implementation of these activities to promote changes in each country. Agreeing on common principles and standards and promoting investment in collaborative regional open science infrastructures and its indicators for research assessment. The spirit of traditional and regional collaboration have been a strong support to develop nonprofit scholar led open access in Latin America in the past 20 years. We consider it is a good basis to advance in open science. This is why to the question uh, to this panel about has open science changed the research assessment. From our perspective in Latin America, we could say that the UNESCO Open Science Re Recommendations approved by governments of 193 countries in 2021, together with other international do uh, documents from Global Voices of Science, as the International Science Council, the Global Research Council, Interacademy Partnership, the Global Young Academies, DORA, among others, have arrived in time in these past years to provide the values, principles, and guidelines that will help us advance the research assessment changes we need in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. And again, wonderfully on time there with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, please uh, continue to think about questions, everyone, for any of our speakers and panelists and put them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll move on to our penultimate presentation. Uh, Vincian Gaillard, if you are there, uh, please, uh, when you're ready, uh, proceed with, with your presentation. Okay. Good day all. Can you confirm you, you see the full slide? We see the full slides. Great. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for having this uh, session. I think it is of, of great value. Uh, my name is Vincent Gaillard. Um, I am very pleased to represent here uh, EUA, the European University Association. We represent uh, more than 850 members um, in uh, 49 countries. And um, over the last few years, EUA has uh, collected and developed a solid knowledge base on research assessment in the transition uh, to open uh, science. And so the initial discussion was very much focused on, on indeed uh, research assessment, but then um, the scope of the debate has been broadened over the lately uh, to include incentives and rewards um, for all the activities that um, academics do. So this is across the three main missions of universities. Some say that uh, there are more than three, but let's let's go to those ones. So you have research, but you have also education and innovation in service to society. Today, I will present a university perspective on research assessment and academic assessment, because this is still of very much uh, value to us, with survey data and strategic priorities. 
But before I start with some data, I really wanted to share an anecdote. Um, I, it turns out that I was also in Croatia, uh, the initiative of, of Jadranka to access the Diamond Open Science, uh, the Diamond Open Access Conference a few days ago. And on my way to um, uh, Zadar, um, in the flights, uh, I was I was reading I was reading the the, the in flight uh, magazine. And um, there was an interview of a leading scientist from from Croatia, and you know you know what, <laughs> the article from the in flight magazine. Uh, so the the journalist noted that this professor is among the top two percent in the world scientists with the highest citation impact. And to me, like that was a, a in flight magazine. So even if if that kind of article is. Uh, going to that deep level of, of details on bibliometrics and this is to me really a sign that we we should change and there is a big profound culture change that is needed so um th this session is very timely um i think so let's get let, uh, getting back to eua i would like to start with some uh data so at eua we survey our members very very often and in a um, uh, an open science survey uh, from last year, we see that 34% uh, of uh, respondents do not include open science practices in their career um, progression or their funding allocation decision uh, processes. This kind of, un well, yeah, uh, unfortunately um, confirms compelling results from our 2019 uh, survey results, specifically in the context of research assessment in a transition to open science, where you can see that um, we have the category toward uh, the bottom of the slide, open science and open access. So this category is the least important category of acti academic activities for research careers, for the, the assessment. So overall, we can say that there is limited consideration to open science um, at, at the moment. And I would say that uh, if we get back to the, 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 the report I mentioned initially, so the last one, we see that for the institutions that use at least one element of uh, open science in their academic um, assessments, they mostly confine their attention to open access to research publications at the very top of the of the of the figure. In addition, and that uh, completely connects to what uh, Juan Pablo was saying, 75% uh, of our respondents continue to use the GIF making it the most widely used publication metric. Even more worryingly, uh, they use this uh, journal-based metric as, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting too fast here. Uh, journal-based metric as a, an imp to be applied at, at researcher level, individual researchers. Um, so in other words, there is uh, a long way, a long uh, journey and a long, um, way to go, a lot to be done, to change the culture towards more responsible, transparent, and sustainable uh, assessment practices. And in this, in this direction, I very much uh, go in line with what uh, Izu was mentioning. On the bright side, because there should be a bright side, uh, change is happening now. And universities um, are driving it. So uh, you have here a few examples in, in the slides of what is happening now. Um, the academic sector now has a unique opportunity to reclaim ownership of research assessment and to align it with core academic values. Academic values were mentioned uh, by Juan Pablo already. So you have academic freedom, institutional autonomy, you have um, research integrity, diversity and equity, inclusion, cooperation, um, openness, um, knowledge sharing, critical thinking, uh, democracy. These are very important values, core values to universities. Um, and so this whole discussion um, is, of course, of strategic importance for an, uh, an organization as EUA. Um, I put here a link to our vision uh, for 2030, Universities Without Walls. It calls for a reform of academic careers. And as you can see that I highlighted it, it includes enabling and valorizing open science in career and research assessment. So this is why um, EUA actually Entered, entered into this discussion 
with research assessment in the transition to open science bro is broadening it up to um, academic career assessment but of course um, we also uh, still very much look into research assessment with with open science in this and then here, I would like to mention the open science agenda, EU open science agenda, very recent, which is to ensure the inclusion of incentives and rewards for open science throughout the research process. You have our um, vision there. I'll get to uh, the end of it. This, I think, will uh, nicely um, bridge to Jean-Emmanuel. So the good thing is that change is happening. It is happening not only at universities, but um, across the board. Uh, many actors are involved. There is an agreement on reforming research assessment. There is a vision there uh, to change assessment to better recognize the diverse outputs practices and activities to maximize the quality and impact of research. So I'll leave it here uh, uh, for um, Jean Emmanuel to say. To conclude, we need to step up. We need to join forces within a coalition. The moment is now. There is something big happening now, and we need to seize this unique opportunity to shape research assessment together for tomorrow and beyond. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vanshan. I will stop now sharing. hand over. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to stop sharing. I'll do my best. So you can go on, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay, excellent. Uh, you've stopped sharing. Uh, okay. So we will now introduce our final speaker and panelist, uh, Jean Emmanuel Four. Yes, sir. whenever you are ready. Um, I believe uh, Ruby will be advancing yes. your, controlling your slides for you. So Absolutely, thank you. Take it away when we're ready. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon or morning to everyone. Um, and first, thank you to give me the opportunity to present uh, an EU perspective. Um, I, in order to address the, the question of the session, I'd like to look at uh, both policy developments and also at uh, the implementation of changes to research assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first message I would like to convey is that open science is influencing the EU policy agenda for research assessment. And I will illustrate this uh, with this slide. Uh, back a few years ago, uh, the Open Science Policy Platform, which uh, was an advisory group to the commission, very clearly identified that rewards and incentives are a key, if not the key limiting factor for uh, mainstreaming open science. Uh, the dominance of criteria that are not rewarding, uh, openness, uh, uh, open collaboration and early sharing has already mentioned by, by other speakers. Um, based on this analysis, in 2020, the Commission uh, proposed in its communication on the new European research area to improve research assessments as part of the actions uh, uh, for open science. Uh, this in the following years has broadened uh, to a more general uh, reform of research assessments. Uh, in the Council conclusions of end of uh, 2021 uh, that come together with a, a policy agenda that identifies priority actions for uh, the EU. Uh, the policy agenda includes one priority on reforming research assessment. Uh, further momentum has been gained under the French presidency of the uh, Council of the EU uh, with the Open Science Conference that dedicated a large share on research assessments and was associated with the Paris call on reforming research assessments. And so together with this uh, momentum, uh, there was also very strong political support expressed later in June through uh, Council conclusions on research assessment and implementation of open science. So with this, I, I wanted to show how starting with open science, the EU agenda on research assessment has become uh, shaped and reforming research assessment has become a priority for the EU. On the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, the second message I would like to pass is that open science is also triggering global dialogue on research assessment. 
I will illustrate this only with uh, uh, a few elements here. First, uh, a subgroup of the Open Science Group under G7 has been created and is discussing research assessment and the broader issues of incentives. Uh, also, in addition to that, following the UNESCO recommendations that uh, on open science published last year, uh, UNESCO has established a number of uh, working groups of which one is looking at open science funding and incentives, in particular with the aim of making recommendations when it comes to researchers' assessments. Uh, the work of the work group started uh, uh, some weeks ago and a second meeting took place uh, earlier this week. And there are other initiatives, uh, working groups looking at the global level at, uh, for example, the GRC working group on responsible research assessment and not to mention, of course, initiatives like DORA and others. Next slide, please. My uh, third message, uh, the third message I would like to convey is that, uh, of course, progress uh, may have been uh, slow, but we see a momentum and in, in, in implementation. So now switching from policy to implementation, the movement uh, with the policy context is facilitating helping the implementation of changes by the stakeholders, by the research funders, the research performing organizations, and, and other uh, stakeholders like, for example, uh, national evaluation, evaluation agencies and others. Um, during the course of 2021, uh, the Commission facilitated uh, um, uh, consultation of stakeholders in the view of facilitating the coming together of stakeholders uh, around a coalition to, re to help reform research assessment. Uh, the long consultation we did uh, led to a, a report, scoping report, where we identified the principles that could be agreed by research organizations to reform research assessments and identified uh, the formula of a coalition as a way forward. So a stakeholder driven initiative bringing together organizations around these principles, but going beyond that, not only around principles and uh, having a mere declaration, but also committing, committing to a list of actions and uh, actions to be implemented within an agreed time frame. Uh, the agreement was co-designed with stakeholders and was published last July. And now we are building on this to form a coalition that could represent the platform for mutual learning, for exchanging on during the coming years and implement effectively changes to research assessments. The vision uh, for this uh, agreement and coalition is that assessment of research, researchers and research organizations should support the quality and impact of research by first recognizing the diverse outputs, not only publications, um, more broadly, data, softwares, etc., as was mentioned already uh, by several speakers. Uh, diverse practices, in, which includes open collaboration, early sharing, and also of activities, for example, societal engagements, to maximize the quality of research and the, the impact that derive from this. And this requires basing assessment primarily on qualitative judgments that is supported by a more responsible use of quantitative indicators. And I would like to end uh, my intervention with a, a fourth message on the next slide, please. Uh, being that uh, open science, uh, and this is an example of implementation actually, influenced the funding conditions of the new Horizon Europe program when compared to uh, the pre its predecessor, Horizon 2020. Uh, first, uh, the evaluation criteria have been have evolved and the quality of open science practices is now assessed under the excellence award criterion for research proposals. In addition to that, under another award criterion, which is for the uh, quality and efficiency of implementation, the applicants need to demonstrate expertise to practice open science. They need to consider more diverse outputs than just publications uh, from earlier achievements. And when they refer to publications, they need to present a qualitative assessment of publication impact, not chief. Um, and beyond that, very quick, of course, we have a reinforcement of the legal provisions in the grant agreements that strengthen open access rights and obligations for beneficiaries and a push for a responsible data management. 
beyond that, under Horizon Europe, there is mainstreaming of open science practices across the program. So in the various calls that are published, there can be now reference to certain open science activities that would need to be incentivized or mandated in projects like societal engagement, citizen science, etc. And last but not least, at program level, uh, for monitoring the impact of the program, key impact pathways have been developed that in particular address open science practices. And I would like to stop here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Emmanuel. Uh, well, we now have just under 30 minutes uh, for some question and answer and further discussion. I would request that all of our speakers and panelists uh, turn your camera on. And I am going to hand over to my colleague, Jadranka, uh, to manage the Q&A. Um, but I am always here if you need me. Jadranka, over to you. Again, so I cannot turn my camera on because he's disabled by horse. So if horse can do something about it. But uh, yes, beside interesting discussion in chat area, uh, we have interesting questions too. So the first one is actually more common than a question by Ludo Waltman uh, about critics uh, on uh, general impact factor. Uh, instead, according to Ludo's view, instead of critics of general impact factor, we should consider reforming uh, uh, publishing system, which is uh, based uh, yes on prestige economies so, and. Um, Yes, uh, I, I can't see any any exact exact question here, but uh, maybe we could get some comments from our speakers on that. Should we really consider the the state of present scholarly publishing system and uh, actually do we need journals anymore for for the scholarly communication on public please. Uh, thank you, Luda, for the for the question. Actually, also echo the question that Adrian Stanley was also asking about. You know, are our, our researchers even aware of the details about the impact factor? I'll say that what we find is that it is that uh, the impact factor is used as a stand-in for uh, more for citation-based assessment, and so it uh, it is a bit of a red herring to put a lot of the focus on the impact factor itself. Although there is. Uh, in certain countries specifics about being indexed in web of science and so the citation assessment is in some sense tangibly tied to the general impact factor but more often than not it's just serving as a stand-in for uh, citation based metrics and citation assessment and, and so you're right I think to call attention to the fact that it is not necessarily the right conversation to have but it is a dominant narrative and and so there is a need, I think, on our part as we discuss research assessment to make explicit that this that is one of the pieces that we're trying to move uh, to move away from. And I think that the conversation around transforming assessment towards something that is values based also around broadening the conversation from research assessment to the change in the broader culture at the university. Uh, and so that means moving away from just looking at it as a research assessment problem and more around what is the role and how we assess faculty careers um, is an important one. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Yeah, uh, Dominic, yes, uh, yeah, I will give the floor to you, but uh, there, there are mo more questions on journal impact factors. So actually the negative influence in uh, on African journals and, uh, and one question is related to the new openness factor future in the future. So if you just can include also this question in your answer, please, Dominic. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Ludo, we completely agree at CLAC. So we have to transform scholarly and knowledge communications. Uh, we don't have to care about transforming the industry. It takes care of itself to transform from subscription to to open access requirements by Plan S and by OSTP in US, we will have the problem to pay APCs. 
So we look to transform the cellular communication systems. And um, we have a, such richness of uh, knowledge produced in Latin America that can contribute to solve daily needs, daily problems, but they are not in the scope of contents considered for scholarly, traditional scholarly communications. So we are waiting for next generation repositories with peer review added. We are waiting for new formats of communication of knowledge. We are experimenting at Claxo um, where our working groups are required to have a 30% of participants from outside the academia. So there's a huge universe of knowledge that is waiting for improvements in scholarly communications. Thank you. Jan Emanuel, please. Yeah, maybe to, to, to complement these, these points, uh, I, I think I, I, I agree with the point that you make, uh, Ludo. Uh, uh, but uh, as uh, one uh, point to uh, the, the the issue is that uh, there there is this dominance uh, of, of the GIF, and I think, in my view, it it uh, it it is a barrier to actually uh, developing these new ways of of communicating. It's uh, we 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 see this uh, with the development of open access publishing, uh, the hesitations of uh, of of some scientists to. Uh, to publish uh, in, in in these venues and uh, in new innovative ways of uh, of sharing uh, uh, knowledge, because uh, because uh, very explicitly in some universities and others, uh, there is still the consideration that is very high to uh, where uh, the, the the data are published, where the knowledge is is shared uh, on the journals. So. I think it's also the, the two are very much linked, and one contributes to locking uh, the, the 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 development of alternatives in publishing. Thank you. There is one interesting question by John Tenria. Sorry for pronunciation about disadvantages or limitations of adoption and use of open access, open research assessments or new type of research assessment in the context of open science. Anyone would like to address this? Vincian, please. Yeah, thank you for uh, the question. Um, I, I may be biased, but I don't see any limitation or um, that there, there is nothing that is a good reason for not having transparent um, practices uh, for research assessment, uh, uh, transparent procedures, procedure, uh, transparent criteria, um, transparent information as to the process and the different way it is done about who assesses and how uh, it has been done. So this is at I think one of the easy, the most, the easiest way to start with, and that connects to one other question, which is okay. Uh, it's it's good to be about culture change, big change, and so on. But how do we start small? How do we how do we start uh, short term? I think that this is an easy step. Transparency in the the process, the criteria, and so on. Uh, it's something that is easily implemented implementable, and I don't see what can be set uh, um, as an obstacle. Thank you, Vincent, to answer also uh, Anna's question. And uh, next question is by David Chotton. Can research assessment ever be truly open unless the source citation data it itself are fully open, enabling metrics based on publication to become fully transparent and reproducible. Please, Juan Pablo. 
Yeah, just to say, I mean, there, there's different parts of this, and this is a conversation that I think is ongoing around what are the right data sources, but I think that is also similar to the conversation about the impact factor, a little bit of a distraction from the core of what needs to be done. So yes, I think that there needs to be uh, the use of open sources to be able to do that assessment, mostly so that we can include all of the scholarship that's actually out there. And this is uh, something, you know, we just released this preprint uh, a little bit around the 25,000, now we think of more than 30,000 journals using OJS around the world that show that there is a huge number of publications that are out there that are not currently included in commercial databases. And that means that the scholarship published there is not being counted when anyone is being assessed through those citations. It also means that citations coming to or from those journals are not included. So, so I agree with the core that's there, that assessment needs to be looking broadly and including counting every kind of scholarship that's out there. But more broadly, I think that it's that that isn't the core of the conversation. The, the changes that I think need to happen are ones that in really look at the activities of a researcher more broadly that include other kinds of outputs that are not just the publications and that, that some of those things will never be able to be captured in any database. And so we need to be looking at different forms of assessment. Um, and that there's a lot of practices that researchers do um, uh, that are not going to lead to a product of any kind. And that those are also practices that we want to see value. Opening science, open science means opening to society and it means engaging with those societies. And a lot of those things is building relationships with communities. Uh, interacting, listening, forming your research questions based on those conversations. Uh, we need an assessment that considers uh, someone that's adopted the ethos of open science uh, and not just uh, looking at outputs from a particular uh, databases, although that is in itself another laudable goal. Thank you. Very interesting questions. So it's uh in Q&A area by Amy. So how could publishers help and then encourage a shift in research assessment? And could publishing non-traditional outputs help in this sense? Uh, so what can we do to make sure universities take this different type of output seriously? It's easier to raise the hand, to react to your hands. Um, well, it, it, I think it's a very good, um, it's a very nice offer <laughs> in a way to think of this. I, I would say that um, going back to the reputation part and uh, what what matters in a way and what, what is uh, considered valuable, um, a way for publishers to help would be to put more um, um, focus on this, so to kind of promote more those other types of outputs, put them in the focus. You have in many publishers like something that is like focus on this or focus on that. And so that indeed increases the visibility of more traditional um, scholarly outputs. So uh, again, I'm not a publisher. So this is really from, from um, my point of view, uh, external to this um, publishing world. But I think that increasing the visibility of different kinds of outputs would be a first, a first step in the right direction. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Dominic, please. You're muted, yeah, I mean. you are muted. Sorry, uh, I agree with Vincent, improving the visibility of those uh, diversity of formats. And also for publishers, not, not, consent, not looking for impact factors in their journals, looking how to give visibility to the quality of their own journals. Uh, because yesterday in a presentation, no, the first day in the presentation about, by Anasuya Sengupta from India and UK, very interesting from the whose knowledge, she's founder of whose knowledge. And speaking of the diversity of languages in the world, 
and uh, I would add the diversity of formats for communicating knowledge about very local, much needed research. Um, take care of quality, give visibility to the description of quality. We have so many academic books which don't describe the peer review process. We have so many videos, we have so many interviews and data sets that nobody takes care to give, to describe how quality have, has been taken care to produce that uh, communica research communication uh, output or digital object. Uh, so I would uh, recommend looking for publishers taking care always to describe the quality of their content and not so much run after impact factors. Thank you. And yes, our next question is related to, to, to the comment uh, by Dominic. So, and it's about uh, uh, the, the future metrics which will be used in, uh, in research assessments. So all initiatives are going towards more quali qualitative research assessments, but still we will have for sure some uh, quantitative metrics. And uh, the question is related to the usage of uh, uh, number of dial downloads. So could number of downloads at similar metrics uh, help us somehow in the future? Juan Pablo. I'll jump in uh, if, if uh, nobody else uh, wants to. I, I think that the, there's two parts to this. I think, yes, I think uh, usage is an important um, thing to be considering, because especially because there's a, some, a lot of things that are captured there. And if I look back at my own research, when I looked at Latin American scholarly portals like Cielo and Relic, we found that there was a huge amount of downloads from folks that were not going to be created, they were not authors, right? So we had students and we had, you know, 20% or 15% that were coming from outside of academia. And so downloads gives you a sense of sometimes something that is being put out there, the value of it having been open, allowing other people to be able to take part. Um, but we need to be careful that it's never about just finding the right metrics. I remember a concept being thrown around some years ago around like a basket of metrics. And all we needed to do was just have a whole bunch of different metrics that people could choose from. Um, if we stick to assessment that is uh, that continues to put metrics at the heart of it, we're already, I think, going in the wrong uh, in the wrong direction. We're continuing to subscribe to this logic that the only things that matter are those that can be uh, measured and that can be quantified, and, and we are not worried or we're not looking at ways of trying to understand more of this the broader opening. So if we really want an open science and embracing the full definition, that whole wheel in the UNESCO recommendations of open science. If we want to embrace that broader vision of what open science can be, then uh, metrics are never going to be the solution. They can be part, they can be used as evidence, they can provide some indicators, but it needs to not be at the heart of the assessment in my view. Thank you, Vincent, please. Yeah, thank you. If I can uh, compliment so fully agree. Um, these are tools, and so they are. They are tools, and they should get back to their tools position. So they should not be understood as this is the mean of uh, uh, assessing. They are just there and support. Um, in terms of uh, the different, because someone in the chat uh, in the Q and A also mentioned the what about a openness uh, uh, factor. Why not? Um, the why not? There were like, there were um, factors on on uh, social impact. On there are many ways to assess what is important. I think that more and more, at least in the in the context of universities, if you look at the at the Dutch uh, initiative and program Room for Everyone's Talent, it's about rewarding rewards and incentives for academics, and the the core message is. It all depends on the context. So if someone as a researcher, as an academic, as a 
uh, is working a lot on on um, uh, let's say improving open science practices and uh, contributing to the debate. Well, some something related to uh, how open um, um, uh, this the outputs are would be would be relevant. Um, if if someone is more towards a impact to society, maybe something related to impact would be a more um, uh, relevant metric to support uh, the contribution of that person to um, the academic world and to society. Going into the the citations, again, it depends. Uh, what 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 do we what we what do we get as an information out of this number of citations? All in all, these are only tools to support the evaluation that should be a comprehensive evaluation, qualitative evaluation of the contribution that is made to science, to research, to uh, society. And whatever um, can be used is to be used, but uh, with, let's say, um, moderation. Thank you. And before proceeding to our last questions, but Carl, I would like to ask is it to quote and to return a little bit to this uh, comment on uh, uh, somehow discriminative policy related to, for example, African journals, and uh, I will not return to journal impact discussion, but is it to cook? Uh, According to your view, uh, are recent incentives for, for more uh, qualitative uh, research assessment and uh, a kind of uh, giving the space to uh, all journals with good editorial policy, not with high impact factor, would solve some problems in Africa and give African journals more visibility? Sorry, can you come with your question one more time? Uh, I just returned to the John's comment on on uh, negative impact of uh, uh, present research metrics on African journals and kind of uh, a discriminative exclusion of African journals from the global uh, landscape of journals based on prestige. So could you? see that the recent initiatives and changes uh, of the research assessment could help African journals in that sense? Um, uh, I will always um, uh, take a view, uh, a different view when it comes to, you know, the use of impact factors in assessment, especially when it comes to Africa, just like uh, John rightly pointed out, it has greatly disadvantaged journals published from Africa, because when you put that peg, you know, you have to have this H index, this journal impact factor, you have to publish there. So you see some of the top researchers from Africa pursuing some specific journals that have those impact factors. And what happens is that at the end of the day, you have, you know, some of the journals that are published in Africa not growing, you know, they're not, you know, being patronized, they're not, you know, and the truth remains that your, your, your findings that are peculiar to a particular environment will be more useful when they are published in specific places to be able to have more impact. And for open science, it has to be about uh, not just the openness, you know, you, you talk about quality beyond quality, there should be impact. And that's why I agree with what Vincent said about why can't we have something like openness, you know, have some kind of data to uh, uh, link us to the real impact of a particular uh, output, research output. So I would say that in a way to include, you know, uh, publishers from Africa, different journals, we should in a way try to completely abort. To an extent uh, from Nigerian experience, we do not really, really pay much attention to um, the journal impact factor, it is being recognized, but what we pay attention to is the H index. So you have many of the uh, universities paying attention to H index, which is also a problem on its, on its own. So if we can play down on these 
uh, uh, tools, like we've all agreed, they are tools. We appreciate them. We, are, we, we, we recognize them, but they should not be used to make assessments, you know, on a general basis. For example, let me um, uh, uh, create an analogy. You have someone that is doing a study in public health versus someone that is doing another study in a very small area. You do not expect the citation level to be the same because public health almost affects almost every area uh, um, of research. So you see that having a look, focusing on the statistics as a basis for research assessment is kind of deceptive. And it intends to portray that some are you know, good researchers, why some are not really good researchers. And it doesn't really give the real value or the impact of uh, a particular uh, a research output. So I think we need to play down what advocacy should be done, you know, at the institutional levels to be able to play down on the use of these um, uh, uh, metrics, you know, for even journals. I think basically the journals are promoting them, you know, in a way to also market the, 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 their journals and, and a whole lot of that. So we need to be more, you know, moderate some of these things to help us uh, to get ahead and not to widen the gap already existing between some uh, low-income countries and high-income countries and some other people that kind of have some research disadvantages. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Ian, do we have time for two more questions? Two more quick questions, yes. We have about three and a half minutes left. Okay, two more, <laughs> two more quick questions. So the first one is, uh, uh, uh related to to the critical mass of already implemented uh, uh, new research assessment criteria so the researchers will have the same conditions as different institutions so could someone comment on that how can we reach critical mass i think jean emmanuel may want to Take that one. I can contribute if you want. Uh, may I? Yes, please. <laughs> so um, I think this is a, an extremely important point. And I think it's uh, it's exactly the, the reasoning of developing a, a coalition approach to bring uh, a maximum number of institutions together to align on principles and actions so that we don't create or are not left with discrepancies between between assessment systems across the uh, the ecosystem of assessment and uh, second point in my view the importance of bringing together not only the research performing organizations but also the funders also the researchers themselves and and then all other stakeholders that are necessary like uh, uh, national evaluation agencies, all those that are involved in research assessment to create this critical mass. Otherwise, indeed, there is a risk that uh, the solutions that are developed are first uh, not recognized by a broad spectrum of organizations and uh, are creating uh, uh, divergences that can be very uh, detrimental for the research community, I think. Thanks a lot. And at the end of our session, we have a question related to time. Uh, so, so we all know that more qualitative research assessment will be also more time consuming. So how the question is about how uh, we can incentivize time being built into the system and how can, can we actually create space for it? Someone wants to answer this. Uh, Bansian, I think uh, you were first with a quick answer. Yeah, quick. Uh, thank you. A very good question. I have to say right away that I don't have a ready-made um, 
solution or American recipe uh, to increase time. Uh, we There is only 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. Um, the activities and hats that are worn by researchers and academic researchers in particular are so many uh, that Indeed, this is we, we just have to accept and face that this is this would be a major challenge in um, changing the way um, it is organized. We are aware of that, but I think again that it's a call for a working together in a coalition. This this will be the solution. It's together reflecting on how to do that. We will have to test, we will have to pilot, we will have to learn from mistakes or challenges, difficulties, and to improve together. So I'm confident we will get there in a way that is sustainable, but let's face it, it will take time. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm going to have to, I think, bring us to a close there. Um, thank you to all of our speakers and panelists. Thank you, Jadranka. It's been a pleasure organizing this with you and a pleasure hosting all of this wonderful audience with so many questions. I'm sure we could go on much longer. Well, I hope we've all got um, a better understanding of the current state of, of the landscape with respect to research assessment and open science. I hope we've got a better understanding of the challenges, but also I hope we've got um, some hope with respect to uh, a lot of very interesting and worthwhile initiatives that are happening. So with that, um, I would like to close this session and we'll be back in about 15 minutes with the, the next session of the conference. Thank you everyone very much. Good day. Mm -hmm.